Yeah. Okay, well, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's get started. Um, so, first of all, welcome to the final lesson of the 3D uh, modeling course. Um, the idea for today is to sort of close the course by giving you an overview of applications uh, so that you have a better idea now that you know a lot of the theory and the processing methods that can be applied with 3D modeling. How can, um, yeah, how can you apply this knowledge in practice? Uh, there are also some courses within the Master of Geomatics that you can take if you are more interested in the application side of things. Uh, but it's nice that if you are able to get a bit of an overview, like sort of all sorts of different topics, maybe you're interested in doing like something related to this in your thesis uh, later on. Um, yeah, I think I will take like um, half an hour or 45 minutes. And after that, uh, I'll be here to answer questions about the lessons or homework three. And Ravi is also here if you have questions about the marking of homework one. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, yeah, this figure sort of gives you um, a few of the examples of uh, applications of 3D modeling. So let's say that you have a sort of simple semantic 3D city model, the sort of thing that we have uh, looked at already. Um, so, and by that I mean you have a, the geometry uh, with some decent amount of detail, but you also have a semantic surfaces, so you know what's the roof, what's the, what's the walls, um, yeah, where you have the doors and so on. Uh, based on that, you can compute things like visibility analysis, so things like if you have a window, what are you able to see from the window, like Sometimes if you talk to people who are interested like in real estate and selling apartments, it's very important for whether you're able to view a certain landmark or not. Uh, the price might differ or maybe there are privacy issues like are, are you able to look uh, in uh, through a window like from a park or a street or something. Uh, you can also do like solar potential estimation. This is very common. So given uh, all the space that is used on roofs and their orientation and their azimuth as you have uh, already calculated, what is the potential for installing uh, solar panels on top of your house or any other house? Uh, there are three cadaster issues, so uh, things like the value of houses, registering property, uh, yeah, available space, volume, and so on. Uh, there's energy demand estimation, and we have a course uh, given by Giorgio about that. So what is the energy efficiency of a house based on the insulation, based on the shadows, um, based on the materials that it's using? You can do emergency response, like for evacuations, what happens if there's a flood, if there's an earthquake, um, uh, how are you going to reach a certain area? Uh, which uh, areas are going to be affected based on some sort of disaster, like um, flood. Uh, you can compute shadows from a building, and this is important in a lot of different fields, including also like uh, the solar potential, because if you have a very nicely oriented roof, but it's almost always in shadow because there's a nearby building, it's not worth it uh, to install solar panels. Um, but also this is related to, uh, um, yeah, like um, uh, permits for construction. And this depends on the place where you are, like in the city of The Hague, for instance, there's a regulation that says that you should be able to find a point in the front of the facade at a one and a half meters height, where you are able to get a certain minimum number of hours of sunlight. And based on that, um, uh, construction is allowed or not allowed. Uh, you can do indoor navigation, so between rooms, which is the closest route, like of course, it doesn't matter for a small house, but you can imagine that for a big building, it makes sense. You can manage utilities. So for most of the course, we have focused on only buildings, but uh, things like uh, pipes, uh, electricity networks, heating uh, networks, and so on are very important. And also, uh, yeah, noise. Uh, so if you want to put a new road, if you want to widen it, if you want to install a new tram line or a train line, how does this affect the neighboring uh, properties? Um, yeah, these are some examples taken uh, from uh, Filip Bilecki's thesis, like uh, more graphically showing like few of these examples. So 
if there's a flood, uh, what happens, what is uh, flooded or what is not flooded. The here a 3D model already gives you a much better impression of how things look compared to just a traditional 2D map. Like in a 2D map, uh, you know like maybe which areas are going to be flooded, but you don't take into account like the height of the buildings. And sometimes like in rescue situations, it's very important whether people are able to get, you know, like on top of the roof and they can be rescued from there, or if the whole thing is going to be submerged. Um, yeah, this is a noise propagation example. So for instance, if you want to install like a tram track or something uh, going to a road, uh, what happens with the noise? And you can sort of see here, like when there's a empty space, uh, the noise travels further, like in this uh, curve here. Uh, then when you have uh, buildings and the taller the buildings, the more they absorb the noise, like uh, so it's less able to pass through towards the back. Um, yeah, this is a uh, solar radiance, so things that uh, something that could be related to solar panels, although this is not taking into account things like uh, trees, it's just uh, using a, like the orientation um, and the azimuth. Uh, and visibility analysis, so if you have a certain point on a 3D model, let's say the window here, uh, what are you able to see from there or uh, vice versa, like uh, whether you're able to look at that window from a certain point on the outside. These are just a few small examples of applications, uh, but there are many, many more. So um, many applications are related to visualization. Uh, visualization is very important for things like games, like now there are a lot of realistic games where you that take place inside of a city, but maybe you want to use a realistic city that rather than having, uh, you know, like um, designers and modelers have to model everything from scratch. Um, there are applications for tourism and virtual tourism, people who like to plan their trips or uh, sometimes you are physically in a city, but you have some sort of AR um, uh, application. This is, uh, people are using this like to motivate tourists to come to certain areas or to learn more about certain areas. And for that, you need to sort of have a digital version of the city also uh, so that you can relate what's happening like outside of the screen and inside uh, like a phone. Um, yeah, for navigation, sometimes if you want to do uh, navigation, you want to be able to look at landmarks and give more uh, realistic directions. Sometimes it's not super clear if you just say like uh, left in 200 meters and it's easier to say like you go left and you find this landmark or this uh, store or uh, something else and it, this can be visualized. Um, yeah, we mentioned energy demand estimation. Um, also for uh, computational fluid dynamics, we have a course uh, which is given by Clara in the Masters of Geomatics. Uh, Based on a 3D city model, you can compute the different wind speeds, like you, maybe you know, but there's a famous example here in the campus, like close to the uh, uh, former building of uh, the faculty of, yes, exactly. Where it, uh, you have sort of a wind tunnel that gets super windy and when it's stormy, people are falling from their bikes. Um, there are a lot of videos online. If you're interested, uh, search YouTube for that. It, there are a lot of funny videos. Um, but yeah, it's not only for wind speeds, also this affects a lot uh, like air quality in cities. Uh, uh, there are effects on buildings, so because wind also creates a stress on buildings. So depending on how much wind is expected uh, for a building, you might have to strengthen the structure or not. Um, yeah, we looked at some of the examples for casting shadows. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, starting from this overview, I wanted to discuss with you in a bit more detail, like three examples. These are example master theses made by geomatic students in the past, and I sort of picked these because I know them uh, yeah, relatively well, but also because they are very much related to the topics of the course. Uh, some of are about uh, dealing with geometry, so generating new ge geometries. Uh, there's one also about repairing uh, geometries that you find in uh, 3D city models. And a final one that is more about uh, using these geometries for something else. So the first uh, master thesis was this. Uh, so automatic enhancement of city GML LOD2 models with interiors. Um, it's an old thesis already nine from nine years ago. 
And the idea was that you have a lot of outdoor information already in 3D city models. Uh, these are becoming more and more widely available for a lot of cities. But if you want to get indoor geometry, this is still pretty scarce. Like you cannot find it uh, uh, in a lot of places or basically nowhere. Uh, but back then, the CTGML standard sort of had a NLOD4 definition. And this meant that if you want to model the interiors of buildings, you want to model them as, at an extremely high level, like think of architectural detail with all of the furniture and so on. So this thesis had the motivation of, uh, let's say that we have the outdoor geometry and we have some basic uh, attributes, uh, knowing maybe like the number of floors that you have, because this is a lot of times uh, registered in a uh, cadastro, uh, like in the cadastral data. And from that, we should be able to more or less guess uh, the indoor geometry, because there's usually not too much of a difference between the height of the different stories, right? And sometimes if you see cues from outside of a building, maybe you see like balconies and windows, you know more or less where these are placed. Like a balcony should be more or less at the uh, level of the floor of a story, right? Uh, so yeah, starting from the outdoor geometry and a bit of uh, attributes, we should be able to create a simple indoor geometry. And the idea for that was uh, sort of like an LOD2 geometry. So LOD2 is uh, already like with the correct roof shape and everything. So it has roughly the right shape. And we wanted to create something similar, but for the interior maybe consisting of already the stories and not the rooms because guessing the rooms only from the uh, information that is publicly available uh, widely and from the external cues is very difficult. So the idea was to get sort of an indoor representation that looks more or less like this and to integrate it with the outdoor LOD2 model. Um, yeah, I mentioned some indication of the story. So these are examples of actual uh, building plans stored with the municipality of Rotterdam. Uh, so in these sort of side views, you can see that when you look at the roof um, of a house, many times you have an indication of where um, story ends, like uh, maybe there's sort of an attic and the attic starts more or less at the place where the roof meets the wall of the building. And this is just one example of a heuristic that could be used to guess where the stories end and begin. Uh, yeah, there's another example here. So for instance, in the ground floor of this building, you can see that there's sort of an extension that's poking out. And it would be very weird if this extension uh, sort of occupied halfway uh, the story above. Most likely it fits exactly with the shape of the uh, ground uh, uh, floor of the building. So using these sort of ex uh, external cues, you can already guess the geometries. Uh, yeah, so in order to generate the indoor geometries, one important aspect is the wall thickness. Uh, because depending on that, you need to shift the indoor geometries a bit or a lot. And for that, uh, Ruland analyzed uh, building plans and he came up with a few different categories because these are sort of typical values depending on the age of the building and the type of the building. Uh, so by stacked, it means like, uh, you know, like um, the sort of uh, structure that you see in high rise buildings. So sort of the same geometry every time. Uh, and these uh, non-stacked ones are more or less like the houses. Um, and these uh, median values for exterior walls and shared walls, uh, where shared walls means a wall that's be exactly between two buildings, are the typical ones that were found um, through looking at the building plans. Apart from, uh, yeah, so starting from this information, what rule and this would compute a Boolean set intersection operation, the sort of thing that you might be doing in uh, homework three, so using Seagull. Um, yeah, you know where every story more or less begins and ends. And using a Boolean set intersection of more or less the whole uh, possible shape of the story with the actual geometry of the building, you can compute like which parts are part of one single story. Uh, yeah, so once you compute these uh, individual geometries for every story, 
what he did was something that you are also more or less going to do for homework three, which is to classify the surfaces. So maybe you can take a few cues from this. And the idea is that knowing the normal of a certain surface, you are able to know uh, if something is a ceiling, a wall, or uh, the floor, if you're inside, or if you're outside, uh, the same applies, like whether something is a roof, it's a wall, or it's the ground, right? So um, I think the most interesting example is here, like what happens uh, with walls? Walls are almost perfectly straight, uh, uh, vertical, and when it starts to tilt even a little bit, uh, you are most likely in some sort of attic, right? And if you are on some sort of attic and the, what would you be considering a wall is sort of slanted, you're already talking more or less about the roof. You're not talking about a wall anymore. Um, yeah, so you can also come up with your own classification criteria for homework three, but this is what Ruland did for uh, his thesis. So just based on the angle, the classification into roofs, walls, and ground. And the results are pretty nice. So you can look at some examples here. Um, these all come from the municipality of Rotterdam. Uh, so starting for only from the outdoor geometry that is publicly available from the municipality, he sort of created these indoor geometries of uh, buildings. Uh, here it's not super clear, but it's something like a balcony. Um, and you can also see if you take his results and compare them to uh, like aerial images, like um, yeah, back then Bing uh, had this uh, sort of 45 degree uh, angle imagery, which is sort of nice. and they match uh, pretty well with what uh, was created. Um, yeah, here is another example, one of the stack geometries. Um, I think this example is kind of interesting because it shows that this lower hanging part um, is marked with uh, two stories. And in fact, there are two stories here, like there's uh, one below and there's a parking lot uh, above with a bit of a railing, so it more or less fits. Um, and yeah, if you are already a bit familiar with the Bach dataset, the Bach dataset has something like a usable area um, stored in it, a uh, net internal area. And Ruland came up with a similar kind of value just from uh, estimating it using the geometry, indoor geometry that he created. And yeah, he found out that uh, there was a slight bias here. Uh, so a slight difference between what was stored by the municipality of Rotterdam and what he computed. Um, and after a while and looking at some use cases, it seemed like the municipality of Rotterdam was not uh, deducting the space that was used by, um, by uh, stairs, so staircases, which was part of the definition of the net, uh, if, of the usable area of the building. So apparently people were paying too much tax in Rotterdam because uh, yeah, you, you were being taxed depending on the usable area of your building and the municipality of Rotterdam was not taking into account some of these properties. So that was an interesting result from his thesis. Um, yeah, so next I want to show you uh, this uh, thesis by Damien Mulder, it's from 2015. And the idea was to uh, repair some 3D models uh, so that they can be used in applications. And for that, he used a voxelization of the model. Uh, yeah. Back then and even now, to a bit less of an extent, you find so many 3D city models that have errors in them. Um, yeah. Here are some of the examples of errors. So sometimes you have a missing face somewhere, especially when you have a shared walls between buildings. It's very common that there's not a face uh, in between them. Uh, sometimes you have spikes like this one. So maybe I think this came from a neighboring uh, building. So there was a neighboring house that was a little bit taller. Uh, and uh, then the geometry of the house, the lower house sort of included a small spike that reached up to that level. And all of that meant that 
as you know, it was not possible to even compute like basic uh, statistics, like the volume for these sort of buildings, because they were basically invalid or have an open geometry. So the methodology what there was to read everything in a CTGML, do it as some pre-processing, uh, and then voxelize the geometry. Then uh, through uh, two different approaches that he implemented, he came up with a correct CTGML output. Um, the interesting thing about voxelization is that it's very easy to do some kind of processing operations. We have discussed like with voxels, that voxels are very simple so that you can implement things on top very easily, much more easily than if you were dealing with a vector uh, geometries. And one of the typical methods that is used to determine like what is the interior and exterior of a model is shooting rays. So here's an example of uh, two rays that are being uh, like shot through the building. And the idea is that if you shoot a ray from very far away, once you cross a uh, face or a, yeah, a face of the building, you start being in the, in the interior. And once you cross a face again, you start being in the exterior. And this is repeated, sort of an odd even counting. Whenever you have crossed a surface an odd number of times, you're inside. And if it's an even number of times, including zero, you're outside. Uh, but yeah, this has a few problems. So what happens if you have an invalid geometry? And the idea is that uh, yeah, if there's an invalid geometry because of an overshoot, some, so something that comes out of the building, you will end up uh, with a ray that passes through a bad surface and then marks the rest as being inside, right? Which is a problem. And if you have a gap, it's a similar situation, like maybe in this example shown here, if you shoot a ray from the left-hand side of the image, you reach a uh, surface, and then you mark everything from that point as the interior, even as you exit out of the model because there's no surface to cross. And if you do the same thing from the right-hand side, then uh, you would have the opposite. So even parts of the interior would be marked as exterior. Uh, but the interesting idea about uh, this method is that you don't need to limit it to only a few rays shot from a very few directions you can shoot all sorts of rays from many different directions and then implement a sort of counting mechanism. So if a uh, volume is more or less closed, uh, but has a few missing faces here and there, you should be able to count, uh, sort of a, find a voting pattern where most of the time, uh, like most of the rays are going to be able to uh, correctly guess what is the interior of the model. And there will only be a few outliers uh, that are incorrect. So if you sort of implement this through majority counting, so if the majority of the rays uh, say that something is the interior, it is the interior. And if the majority of the rays says that something is the exterior, is the exterior. Uh, so in this example shown here, there's uh, the overshoot from before. And a few rays are going to be bad. But the majority of the rays are going to agree that this uh, part on top is still part of the exterior, like only the very example, uh, the example ray shown here is going to say that the, uh, yeah, that the voxels are above, are going to be part of the interior of the model. So majority counting is able to fix this case with overshoots and the same goes for gaps. So um, only a few cases of rays are going to be able to pass through the gaps in the surfaces of a building. Uh, so all the same thing applies with a majority voting pattern, you are able to get the correct value. And one example that a uh, few have asked uh, indirectly um, when we talked about voxels is what happens once you voxelize something like you get a sort of a bad model, right? It's sort of a blocky, it has basically the shape of the original voxels. So Whenever you want to go back from voxels to something that is smooth or looks more like the original geometry, there are a few different approaches. Uh, the most typical one is uh, marching cubes. So marching cubes starts with a sort of a library uh, of uh, voxel combinations. So 
you define a two by two by two uh, region of voxels, and for every possible combination of voxels within within that region, there is a smoother surface. Sorry. Well, uh, yeah, the thing is that if you do three by three by three, there are a lot more combinations, right? Yeah, Possible ones. Then it also makes sense. Yes. So, um, yeah, sort of matching cubes in 2D sort of, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of a corner part of the building. And basically, it means that you cannot create very smooth things. Uh, you can create three by three by three or bigger uh, sort of models, but the bigger you make it, the more possibilities there are. And basically you need to code every single possible combination and you think about how it's going to look. So what most people do is just two by two by two uh, for marching cubes. And these are only like a, a couple of examples of how things look. So if uh, seven of the voxels are marked as inside, but one on the corner is marked as outside, uh, you can define that this is the output geometry that you will get as smoother geometry. If two of the voxels are missing, so these two uh, ones on top, you can come up with something like that. So it means, uh, yeah, looking at every possible combination of voxels marked as interior and exterior and creating a geometry that looks uh, like that. Uh, fortunately, you don't need to code all of them by hand because there are actually implementations that show you like all the possible cases and how to implement them. Uh, but yeah, still, um, as you have pointed out, like this doesn't give you very smooth looking results. So an improved version of uh, marching cubes is called dual contouring. So uh, with dual contouring, it's important to notice that whenever we have a grid, like a voxel grid, there's also a dual representation. So uh, in this case, it would be like a vertex for every uh, cell, every box cell. Uh, these are connected by edges and an edge corresponds to a face, a common face of two box cells. Uh, then you would have like a square faces and square faces in the dual would, represent, would correspond to a to an edge, I think this will be a bit clear later on. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that you can use the dual representation of a voxel grid to compute a better uh, looking uh, surface. And for this, what you do is that if you mark every voxel as being part of the interior or exterior, uh, I think this is not the most clear nomenclature, but this is what is used like uh, in the original uh, description of the method. So the white squares are interior voxels and the squares with an outline are exterior voxels. So when you find an edge that connects an interior voxel with an exterior voxel, uh, it's called a, an edge with a sign change. And if you take these edges and actually faces, and you compute the dual of that, you will reach this uh, dual representation. And yeah, the important thing here is uh, in this figure, which is maybe not super clear. So here we are actually looking at uh, four voxels. So there, I think it's Clear if you look at the, only maybe the um, yeah the black circles. You can see these uh, four uh, faces on the bottom, and there's basically uh, four cubes on top of them. So if you look at the very middle vertex here, and the very uh, and the middle one here, so the middle bottom and the middle top ones let's say that one is in the interior and one is in the exterior. Uh, when you look at the edge connecting them, you could say that it's an edge with a sign change because it connects an interior voxel with an exterior voxel. And out of the edge shown here, you can find the dual 
phase, which is shown here. The dual phase is made of uh, four vertices, and these four vertices correspond to the four voxels. So there's one vertex in the center of each of the four voxels, and the dual edge here that is shown, uh, yeah, intersects the the edge that is shown here intersects with the dual phase that is shown here. So if we took the dual representation and then uh, try to reconstruct the original geometry from it, uh, the idea of dual contouring is that we are able to or get uh, some information from the original geometry. So for instance, when we voxelize a geometry, we, before voxelizing it, we can store uh, the normal vector. So uh, for every surface, you can sort of see the normal vectors uh, shown here, like the original surface looked something like that. It, so it had a normal vector pointing in this direction. And there was an original geometry here. So the normal vector was pointing in that direction. So if we take that plus also the depth, where the depth means like when we voxelize the surface, we not only store uh, whether a voxel is inside or outside, but we also store like what is the point of intersection, how deep it is in the original geometry. So if uh, in this dual, in this edge, the point of intersection was here, so we can store, sort of store like the length of this uh, depth plus their, uh, the normal vector. You are, based on that information, you're able to better reconstruct the original surface than if you only took things into account like interior and exterior. Uh, so even without knowing that the original shape was something like that, just knowing the depth, so the distance between this point and this point and the normal vector, you can reconstruct the original geometry better. And this is not very interesting if you just go from a geometry to its dual and then back. But what happens when you want to uh, do a repair of the geometry? So let's say that we have the original, uh, in this case, polygonal model. So the figure is in 2D because it's clearer. Uh, so this defines the interior and the exterior of the model based on uh, this polygon. If you only do marching cubes, you basically come up with something like this. So you can only have like a, a multiples of 45 degrees, basically. But if you do, do dual contouring, you can come up with something that looks exactly like the original geometry because for every point you just store like how deep it is within the polygon and what was the normal vector. You reach this original representation and then after that, pressing basically just means getting rid of the vertices that are exactly uh, along the same line. If you apply this in 3D, and the details are in uh, Damien's thesis if you're interested, the idea is that you're able to reconstruct the original geometry with pretty good results. So uh, this example geometry with two faces missing is correctly uh, Voxelize using the majority counting mechanism. Um, unfortunately, once you start having multiple missing surfaces, and it's, in this example it's not super clear, but I think it's this triangle and this triangle that is missing, then the results are becoming uh, quite a bit worse because then you find a lot of rays that just happen to pass through both missing faces. Um, still, there are also some artifacts, like uh, whenever things are oriented badly according to the original uh, voxelization, but still the results can be pretty good and they can recover even from faces that are, multiple faces that are missing sometimes. This is a very typical example, like whenever you have like uh, row houses here in the Netherlands, maybe people don't model the walls that are between the row houses because they don't know what they look like, they're completely hidden. And still you're able to obtain the correct uh, geometry for calculations. Uh, yeah, so finally I want to show you uh, one uh, more 
this is this is by Yixin Shu. And okay, I will explain the topic as we go because it's a bit easier that way. Uh, maybe you have heard of uh, the urban heat island effect. Uh, it's a lot in the news in the past few years. So cities are much warmer than the surrounding countryside. And this is basically because there's a lot of, uh, you know, concrete, uh, asphalt, and not enough greenery. Uh, so in this example from the city of The Hague, you can sort of see what is more closely uh, built up. So like, um, yeah, this is basically like the city center of The Hague. And the city center of The Hague is significantly warmer than the areas that are uh, less built up and surrounding the city. So whenever you have a, um, yeah, heat waves in the Netherlands, you have a lot of uh, news articles about old, uh, especially old people who are not doing very well. There are excess deaths because of the heat. Uh, so yeah, the urban heat island effect is very big uh, as we have a increasing uh, global warming, then this is going to be get worse. So a lot of in cities are interested in to how to mitigate the effects of this. Like um, here in the city of Delft, they are looking, for example, at uh, backyards and back gardens. Like there are a lot of them have, a, you know, not grass, but they have tiles. And these tiles basically just help to make everything uh, hotter than it should be. So there's a lot of potential for trying to mitigate this effect. Uh, but the effect is also very hard to measure properly because if you want to look at the typical kinds of um, uh, weather data that you're able to get, these come from traditional weather stations. So these sort of bulky things that you see here in the image, these are uh, well, well isolated, uh, but uh, in the open air so that you get a very good measurement of the temperature. But you only have this, basically a few of these, uh, in a city or maybe one per city. So it doesn't have the resolution uh, that we would want to do this kind of study. But fortunately, there's now a lot of uh, personal weather stations that you can find. Uh, this one here is made by a French company called Netatmo. I have a, actually a couple of these at home. And the idea is that these are pretty low cost devices. Uh, they are you know, not super precise, that you will not get the same kind of quality data that you would get from uh, formal, uh, you know, like a professional weather station, but you can have a lot of these throughout the city. So you could have the correct uh, uh, resolution to uh, measure phenomena like uh, the urban heat island. But at the same time, the data is going to be super noisy. Like this is how this is going to be installed by regular people. Sometimes it's going to be in the sun. Sometimes it's going to be in a badly ventilated space. Some people will want to change the battery and then we leave it in indoors rather than outdoors. Um, so yeah, the data is going to be super noisy. Um, yeah, one important aspect that I forgot to mention is that Netatmo is particularly interesting because uh, if you agree, they, you will also share your outdoor data with the public through a public API. And this is why it can be used for uh, all sorts of studies. So the data is public. And if you go to this uh, website, like the weather, uh, weathermap.netatmo.com, you can see the weather stations that are in a particular area. And it, there's pretty good co coverage, like uh, especially in Europe. And you can also get the same data through the API. Uh, so Ishin looked at how to clean up the data. Um, in particular, we want to get better estimations of the places where these weather stations are located. Like uh, people do say whether the whether their uh, weather stations are located, but this is typically done like from your phone when you're indoors. So the GPS signal is not going to be great, and there's going to be a pretty big difference from the estimated location that you're giving the Netatmo server and where you actually are. But if you are able to have an approximate location together with the 3D city model, you should be able to get a better estimate. That was more or less the hypothesis. And for that, you can uh, look at the different patterns that you have uh, in uh, the weather data. So the X axis here is the time and the Y axis is the difference in temperature. So 
at some points in the day, you will see weird uh, times when the temperature starts to rise abruptly. And these are times when the weather uh, sensor is actually exposed to the sun. So if you have an approximate location and you start looking for better places where that weather station could be located and you check the sort of the estimated behavior for that one based on the way that the sun would uh, hit because we have this data, um, you are able to get a better location for the sensor. Uh, yeah, Yishin started from a point, so created like a big buffer around it and checked like uh, in a script like for all of the potential locations within a certain area. So uh, whether they match the behavior of the sensor better than the uh, original location. In an example shown here, so it was a uh, an outdoor weather station, but the given location was actually indoors. It was inside of a given polygon, so it couldn't be there. But it was there was a high likelihood that it would be located like within only a short distance from that, right? So you can compute a whole bunch of points, and then for each one you check the behavior and whether it matches the behavior of the weather station. And to check the behavior, uh, the idea was to start from the sky view. So the sky view of a point is more or less what is given, like if you stand at a given location and you just turn around, what are you able to see from that location? And in this example shown here, uh, yeah, blue basically means sky, so it's uh, open air. Uh, the green stuff is uh, trees, and this was computed using the HN uh, point cloud. And the uh, gray stuff was uh, buildings. So you can actually say that if the sun is going like uh, from this point to that point, you can guess like which are the times in the in which the sensor is going to get uh, hit by the sun. Uh, yeah, this is more or less what happens with the analysis. So the sun rises in the east and then goes around and sets in the west. This is more or less the curve that is going to be uh, uh, the, the path that is going to be taken by the sun as it goes through the sky view. And you can see that for a lot of the time it's going to be uh, hitting buildings. Then at some points you're going to be able to see it. And then as it sets, it's going to be like uh, below the surrounding buildings. Um, yeah, so these are more or less the results of his study. Like looking at a lot of weather stations in the area of The Hague and using the uh, AHN point cloud and the data from the city of The Hague. Uh, Yishin was able to find uh, good results. So uh, locations, I think these are within one meter for 59 weather stations, where zero here would mean like a perfect location originally. and One would be uh, like one meter away. Um, so we were pretty happy with the results because they he managed to find locations that fit the predicted behavior better than the original locations and then he uh, yeah he did an experiment so in the place that where he used to live he took one of the weather stations and more or less left it like on a table in you know, like uh, getting hit by the sun during certain periods of the day and seeing uh, whether the, his code would be able to match the location of the sensor better than the original location. So, um, yeah, I sort of forgotten what the two colors used to be in here, but okay. The green one is the location that was originally given to Netatmo by setting up the station with the phone. And it was actually in the middle of a street, so for sure the sensor was not there. And one of these was the uh, real location of the sensor. The other was the improved location of the sensor. So from something uh, like uh, this far away, 
uh, the newly matched location was something like this distance away. So uh, using his code, he was able to clean up the data a lot by giving better locations of the sensors, which help us estimate uh, the better the temperature inside the city. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this previously, so just to recap a bit, like if you are interested in the application side of uh, uh, 3D modeling, uh, there are two course recommendations. In particular, we have this one, like a geomatics as support for energy applications, which is given by Georgia. There you can compute like energy efficiency of uh, buildings. You can see uh, how this is stored, like in the 3D city models and in the energy ADE, and also in the future, like the energy extension for city JSON. And there's a uh, modeling wind and dispersion in urban environments, which is given by Clara. And there you will be computing, a, uh, yeah, you will be using a, like computational fluid dynamics to estimate winds, like in 3D cities. Uh, yeah, there are also other possibilities. I didn't mention it here, but you could also be interested in doing like a research uh, assignment. It's like a five ECTS thing uh, within your master's program. Or yeah, if you like this topic, you could also do like your own master thesis based on this. And I mean, you can contact uh, me or Hugo. I think Ravi is not going to be here uh, too much longer, but um, yeah, or any of us in the 3D uh, G information group, we can help you come up with a topic uh, related to applications of 3D models. Um, yeah, these are the sources of the images if you want to have a better look later, but that's it uh, for the course. Do you have any questions about today's lesson first? Okay, well, um, But it's, it's, I think, the first uh, thesis that you showed when he was defining the normals for the ground points, the um, surfaces. Yeah. This. So, so you, you wouldn't define the ground surface of the house. You would only define the ceiling surfaces, like the it's, yeah, so the red would be pointing downwards, but it would be a normal pointing downwards. Yeah, this depends a bit on the way that you define, like which is the normal direction, the orientation for the indoor and the outdoor part. Um, yeah. So I think this is following a different uh, specification than, for instance, City JSON is following. Um, but yeah, he did hit this thesis like in 2013, uh, city JSON didn't even exist back then. Um, Cause you, you could have roofs that have a, uh, like a almost side roof. Like yeah. Uh, like a very straight. Yeah. He just went with a five degree or bigger example. I'm not sure yeah. about that like if it's a slightly tilted uh, wall is it already a roof um, yeah yeah this is a nice point for discussion and maybe something you will analyze in homework three if you have a uh, picked an, uh, an ifc model with a um, um yeah with a non-flat uh, roof anyway but yeah you can use this for sort of inspiration or you can come up with your own thing 